Thank you very much to Green Thumb, Grow NYC, and the community gardeners here at Green Oasis for having uh, the urban park rangers come and speak to you about inviting bats into your garden. Um, again, I'm Ranger Dan, and joined and I'm Ranger by Ashley. Ranger. Uh, we will start by introducing ourselves, the urban park rangers, then introduce our local bats. Then we will talk about the importance of bats and why providing the habitat is good for them. Then we will talk about actually uh, structures that you can put in your garden and uh, how to replicate habitat so you can attract bats. And then we'll finish with how to maintain that habitat and the home, um, as well as troubleshooting and then answer your questions. So uh, we are uh, here as urban park rangers. Um, our job is to uh, be in connect New Yorkers with uh, their parks. Um, so we do that through uh, keeping people safe in the park. You may see our uniforms, our uh, badges. Usually we have a belt as well with all of our tools. Um, so we're a public presence to everything from giving directions to uh, making sure people are being safe in all of our parks. And that even includes little things like street trees and community gardens. Um, our, our major part of our job though, is doing what we're doing with all of you today, is educating uh, New Yorkers about the history and the nature present in their gardens. And then uh, it overlaps a little into the last part of our job, which is, um, which is rescuing and making sure animals are safe in our parks. Um, we uh, started today by, and we hope to maybe at the end, we'll hear some of the places you've seen bats in New York City, but uh, the rangers often see our bats when people call about them because they're concerned uh, if they see a bat during the day, if they see a bat that looks like it's cold on a tree, um, and we go out and investigate. And most of the time, the bat is doing normal behaviors. Um, but we we learn, in order to realize when bats are doing normal behaviors, we have to learn about the bats. And as, if we want to bring bats into our uh, environments for all, we also want to know a little bit more about the bat. So that's the Urban Park Rangers. And now I can introduce some of our local bats. Um, we have two types of bats. Uh, there's about, I believe, nine species that are found in New York State, but only six of them are found in New York City. Uh, and we have bats that uh, come in caves that spend most of their winter hibernating in caves, not in New York City. And then we also have bats that are tree bats, but they migrate uh, similar to the way birds go south and they follow their food and the warmth during the winter. So our first bat is uh, as demonstrated in this photo next to uh, a Q-tip for scale is a little brown bat. And uh, little brown bats are one of the examples of our cave bats. So they spend uh, their winters in caves out in uh, Northern New Jersey, upstate New York, Pennsylvania. And then during the summer, the spring, right around now, uh, they start to make their way out to good environments that can provide them the food and the shelter and that they need. Another bat that is common is a big brown bat, which is a kind of a funny name because they're not that much bigger. They're still a very small bat uh, than the little brown bat. Uh, and they have a similar uh, behavior to the little brown bats in that they uh, live in colonies, usually in caves, um, and then migrate 
to uh, areas where they can find food, water, and shelter during the during the summer. We have another bat. Uh, this is the eastern red bat. Um, and eastern red bats are the coolest. I, we like them a lot because they're the ones you're most likely to see during the day flying. Um, so in New York City, if you're in a park and you see a bat during the day, um, then it's most likely an eastern red bat. And they can, um, they migrate. So like I said, they go south for the winter following the food and the warmth. And they um, also, uh, they mostly roost in trees. So um, we'll get into the habitat a little later, but for Eastern red bats, you're mostly wanna, gonna find them in a forest that has dead trees and trees with bark that kind of peels off because that's where they're most likely to be found. I don't have photos of the other bats, but we have uh, three other species of bats that can be found in New York City. And those are the hoary bat, the silver haired bat and the tricolored bat, uh, which are also like the Eastern red bat are tree bats. They don't go to caves, instead they migrate um, south for the winter. So I'm gonna pass it over to Ranger Ashley uh, to talk about why it's so important that you, why we wanna bring bats into our garden habitats and uh, overall, the whole world, why bats are uh, an important species to protect. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, and that's uh, why they're vital species and why I love them so much is that they are ecological powerhouses uh, from which we benefit in a variety of ways. And now more than ever, they can benefit from our help in creating sustainable habitat. So these uh, benefits that they give us, uh, you might be thinking, other than Halloween decorations, what do they do for us? Well, um, the bats that we have, all of the bats that Ranger Dan named are insectivores, uh, meaning that their diet is comprised of insects. Uh, and especially here in the city, one of those insects that they uh, focus on or that is a main part of their diet are mosquitoes. Now, studies from the Cornell uh, College of uh, Agriculture and Life Sciences have followed brown bats um, in both uh, urban areas as well as more agricultural landscapes. And a nursery or, or colony of 150 brown bats can eat 1.25 million insects in one year, which is not surprising uh, when you consider that our uh, average bat here in New York City can eat about three to 4,000 insects in one night. So when we have, um, you know, a lot of areas in the city that might have ponds or can have standing water, having bats introduced into that area can greatly decrease uh, the amount of mosquitoes or the mosquito population that can be sustained there. Uh, another term that we can think of when uh, bringing this um, or considering this idea is uh, biocontrol. And biocontrol can be broadly defined as uh, introducing beneficial organisms into a system that can uh, reduce or maintain pest insects or pest organisms at a sustainable level. Uh, so again, here in the city, they're going to be eating a lot of mosquitoes, uh, which, you know, no one wants that in the summer, or we, we uh, are not fans of that in the summer, uh, as mosquitoes can introduce uh, diseases like West Nile um, and are also just general irritants. Um, but in agricultural settings, they can, and forest settings especially, they can help control uh, insect populations like tent caterpillar moths, which can do large damage to forests, as well as gypsy moths, uh, which can damage a lot of uh, agricultural crops as well as, as forest lands. Um, so they're amazing uh, insectivores. Uh, they're going to help keep our insect populations down here in the city. Um, but uh, outside of the city and the state, they're also wonderful pollinators. So just like people, uh, they have different preference or different species, which there are over 1300 documented species of bats. Uh, they have different preferences in different diets. So we have pollinator bats, uh, fruit bats, um, and these bats uh, are, um, you know, one bat in particular, 
which as an adult, you might appreciate a bit more, or you should appreciate a bit more, uh, is the primary pollinator of the agave plant. So we wouldn't have drinks such as mezcal or tequila without the uh, long-nosed bat. Um, they can also pollinate uh, tropical fruits, uh, so bananas, mangoes, papayas. Uh, they are vital to prolonging the, um, the life cycle or instilling, I'm sorry, ensuring the life cycle of our fruits as well as disseminating seeds uh, after eating fruit. Um, so they not only help control our insect populations in different ways, uh, there is a fascinating cave down in Texas, Bracken Cave, which is kind of like a, uh, a beacon of con uh, conservation for bats. They have about 20 million bats that, um, that nest or uh, roost in that cave. And in a single night, they can eat up to 200 tons of mosquitoes. So can you imagine that area if those bats were not there? You couldn't pay me to live there. <laughs> <laughs> so we really do appreciate the efforts of our bats um, and that what they do for us, uh, as well as, again, going on to those plants that they pollinate. Uh, chocolate is a huge um, uh, uh, well, a huge benefit of the work that we get from bats on a global scale. So with having, keeping in mind this idea of free pest control or uh, pest integration, um, having this idea of pollination, it's very important for us to maintain and provide habitat for them as they're losing that when it comes or due to uh, effects such as deforestation uh, uh, from, you know, commercial or real estate or, or any kind of um, moving in on that. But also in 2010, we saw the first introduction of a disease called white nose syndrome. Um, white nose syndrome is a fungal disease that if introduced into a nursery or a colony of bats can have a 99% mortality rate. So by providing uh, well-maintained and healthy um, and suitable viable habitats for them, like the bat boxes we're going to be talking about, we can help combat this uh, this disease that is decimating populations here in the East, as well as now being seen in uh, the Western parts of the U.S. as recent as 2016 and 2017. So these hardworking creatures really do need our help right now. So I think we should go ahead and look at some bat boxes and talk about, uh, one, how to choose your box and where to place it once you do choose it. So when we talk about um, creating habitat for the bats, it's more than just building a home for them. Um, although that is necessary because of habitat loss overall. So first we're gonna think about what a bat needs to live when it comes to New York City. Um, so it's gonna need water, it's going to need a safe, warm spot to roost during the day, essentially sleep uh, when the sun's out. Um, it's going to need food, um, and it's going to need food that is out at the time when it's out feeding. Um, so um, since we're in a garden, we can start with uh, the food. Uh, we talked about how they're insectivores, the ones that live in New York City. So uh, a lot of people are interested in bats because they'll eat the mosquitoes, which are active in the early evening. Um, that's when we're outside, the mosquitoes are bothering us. So it always makes uh, the rangers and most people that know what bats are doing uh, happy to see the bats out. But you would also want to plant um, planting that attract, uh, that are evening blooming, um, that would also attract insects that the bats could eat um, as they're leaving their, their bat house. Um, so the second is water. Uh, bats, our bats that live here drink on the wing, meaning uh, I wish I had a better photo of this, but while they're flying, they actually just take a sip of water. So they actually, if you're gonna install uh, a pond, um, which uh, the rangers have also talked about for green them, uh, you wanna make sure that it's actually longer than wide. Like, so a longer pool, a longer pond 
is better for bats than a round pond because they want to have a place to fly. And in their natural habitats, they had also used the water as a flyway uh, where they can quickly duck into the trees, but there's a lot of insects that are near the water. So um, a water feature is a good thing, but you want to make sure it's long. I think about 20 feet is ideal for them to be able to go down and grab a drink of water. Um, then, so that's, um, that's food and water. Um, then the next place is uh, a house. So, <coughs> sorry, um, I think a bug just went in my mouth. <laughs> but I, so we need the bats to come uh, get, get those bugs. But uh, the, as Ashley mentioned, we've deforested a lot. We don't want the bats to come into our buildings, uh, like Green Thumb had an issue with uh, today, uh, mentioned earlier. So we um, we have to replicate the the dead trees, and um, we we all mentioned in the beginning where we found bats, and uh, we see bats a lot in Central Park because they're good open water bodies. There's fields for them to get all the mosquitoes at at night, but then they can duck and hide out in the forest. And a few of our forests, especially in Inwood and Riverside Park and Central Park that are forever wild, we actually leave dead trees. Um, but we know that gardeners, uh, you want to keep living plants around. So uh, you often get rid of dead trees and it can be a safety hazard. So what we do recommend is using a bat house that's going to replicate the crevices in in trees or rocks or uh, human-made structures that uh, are an ideal place for the bats to go. Um, we actually sometimes we have a teenage prog a program for teenagers called RCC and sometimes we have them make bat boxes, uh, so it can be made, it can be bought. Uh, we've done, where some, when we had the RCC, the Ranger Conservation Corps students build the bat boxes, we actually did it purposely to give out to community gardens and other gardens that wanted them um, as their conservation project. But the, the key features of this is that they want a narrow space to go in, um, both for protection from predators, uh, but also to, for the darkness. It does have a flat open here uh, for air and um, for air to get in there. But then they have all this space up top uh, for the, their roosting. It also has a backing. This one's a nylon mesh, but you can also use a metal mesh. And that's, um, although we think of bats as flying, um, their wings are, I actually have a photo for this, are essentially their fingers. And uh, they do have little claws on the end, so they can use their wings and their back feet to climb. And that's how uh, we usually see them clinging to trees, but uh, they can cling onto this mesh and that way they they fly around, they land where they're comfortable, and then they climb up into their roosting spot. Other things about the bat box are placement uh, of where you're gonna wanna do it, where you're gonna place it. So we're actually gonna go over to where Green Oasis Garden placed their, uh, installed their bat box. They they made a homemade built one based off of essentially these plans for this one that you can buy. So we'll migrate over here. Perfect. And um, uh, so before I have a couple more okay, things. <laughs> <laughs> so the the placement of the bat box uh, is for ideal sun exposure, because although they want dark place to sleep in, 
They want a warm place to sleep in. So uh, this bat box is painted black to absorb some of that heat, as well as I know a lot of your gardens are tough. We, we, want, we have all these beautiful trees. Um, so it's hard to find a spot that you want. The ideal spot has is southeast facing, which this one is uh, more east facing um because that's going to get the morning sun uh if you have a southeast exposure and then uh because that gives them a warm place to come back to at night i mean in the in the morning after their night of hunting <laughs> and then you also want it to be about 10 to 20 feet off the ground that is also that's mostly and a metal pole is ideal ashley will talk more about that uh, but it is uh, to help protect them from predators. Uh, that we found that they don't do well if you put them, if you actually attach it to a tree or another structure, because things like uh, feral cats can get them in there, and other predators, natural predators like raccoons, could also climb up trees, and they just tend to not take to ones that are in a tree as opposed to ones on a pole. You can use a wooden pole, but a metal pole is best. Um, you also want, looking in front of it, you want about 20 to 30 feet of open space. So you don't, uh, we've actually recommended they trim back some of these shrub branches near it because that's another opportunity for predators. Um, there's larger bird predators, owls and hawks that might, prey on them. So you don't want anything when they drop out of the nest and fly out that can just sit there and pick them off on a branch as they fly out. Um, and those are the ideals for placement. So Ranger Ashley is going to talk about maintaining your bat box uh, as well as the habit, <coughs> excuse me, as well as the habitat and um, troubleshooting uh, with your bat box. Perfect, yeah, thank you again. So um, we do have a great example of a bat box, uh, bat house placement here. Um, so one of my favorite things, especially this idea of maintaining, um, that is probably the most important aspect of any kind of installation process. Uh, it's great to put something there, but if you can't ensure the longevity of it, um, then, uh, you might want to reconsider placing it elsewhere. Uh, so one of the great things about this is um, when maintaining, you are going to have to uh, look at a couple different features. Um, one is the ceiling of the actual bat box. So we want to make sure that uh, the ceilings are completely airtight. Well, other than the, uh, the ventilation, um, the ventilation blocks that we see there, but we want to make sure that it's sealed so that there's not water getting in there causing mold, that smaller insects can't get into there, um, and that uh, it will just, you know, stand or withstand a little bit longer. So one of the first troubles or issues that you might consider or see is like, oh, if this bat box is 10 to 20 feet up in the air, how can I easily do this? Um, one of the ways, which is very creative, uh, that the garden came up with here is um, actually having this bat box on a telescoping pole. So we do have a smaller instance of it here. And by that, um, they're actually able to lower the bat box down if needed because the pole will extend. And then, oops, well, if there was a bolt in here, it would pop and lock into place, uh, allowing it to, again, uh, extend or lower to the desired height. Um, another way that you can do this is by having, uh, by if you were to do a wooden in a wooden pole installation, um, that you can have a, it's a, a tri-pole uh, base. And you have two poles holding your center in place. So what would be the pole that we're actually seeing up here? And you can have carriage bolts drilled through those three poles. So that way, um, if needed, that center pole can actually pivot and be lowered down to the ground while still being supported by the two uh, wooden posts that it's saddled by. Um, and again, that's going to be important for uh, inspecting your box. Um, and we'll talk about what you should do before you actually ever disturb or try to look in the box uh, doing bat surveys. 
um, by inspecting the box because you want to make sure that you're not having uh, yellow jackets uh, try to nest in there. there those can be aggressive uh, insects that will um, take over a space. Um, so if you ever see a yellow jacket flying in or out of a box, that's a great indicator. Of, it's a big sign that you should uh, do some maintenance on that box there. Now, sometimes you can see paper wasps. Uh, nesting in the same bat box and that's actually been shown to uh, have a, a functioning um, well a roommates uh, between the uh, the paper wasps and the bats um, they're not as aggressive however if you see um, a lot of them going they can eat up like bat box real estate so at that point you would want to remove the paper wasp nest but if you see some uh, building up in there uh, it can be okay depending on the size and the longevity of it um, now, if you're ever going to uh, uh, go ahead and look inside of your bat box or do some work on your bat box, um, there are a couple quick ways to check and see if you have any visitors or anyone actually living in that box, because especially during the winter time, it's uh, crucial not to uh, disturb any sleeping bats as the uh, as um the reason behind that is that they lose uh, vital fat reserves um, that will keep them or hold them over through the winter. Um, so some couple apparent ways uh, to check and see if you have any bat activity in your bat house is one, by looking at the ground around it or the floor around it to see if there's any bat droppings or guano there. Um, if you see anything uh, at the base, then you know you want to uh, that gives you a better indicator that you should be watching around for fly out times or fly in and fly out. So fly out is going to be at dusk, uh, right before night truly falls. That's when you'll see the most activity of bats coming out of the house and then fly in uh, right around uh, dawn. So you'll see a lot of bats going back into the, uh, the house to roost for the day. Um, and I will say uh, in sometimes if bats already found, you know, kind of like a preferable roost, uh, it's okay if you don't see bat activity in your first season or uh, first year of installing your bat house, sometimes it takes uh, a season or two. Um, if you see three or if you go about three seasons or so with, you know, no activity, that's when you might want to start reconsidering um, a, a, a placement or a replacement of your bat house. Um, so again, going off of that idea that Ranger Dan had talked about, kind of like three huge things to consider, uh, which is um, uh, water, security and warmth uh, when actually placing your bat box. Um, here, you may not be able to hear it, but we do have a pond uh, just over to our left that's going to give some of that uh, water or feeding ground. Um, and as Dan said, we made some recommendations to uh, kind of trim some of the branchings here. Uh, one other consideration for security, because you want to make sure that um, when we say security, we talk about both uh, secure from predators, but also secure and stable uh, mounting of the bat box. Uh, so when placing your bat box, you want to make sure that um, not on the idea of stable, that it's not, uh, it's not moving too much in the wind, uh, as you may know, or depending on where you're at. Uh, here in New York City, we can get some pretty blustery days, uh, some gales that are going, going quite strong. So we want to make sure that the bats, uh, they'll be attracted to a more secure or stable um, uh, roosting. You can do this on the side of a building. Uh, not only does that provide more stability, uh, but it also helps regulate temperature a little bit better than a pole mounting would do. However, you fix that with the pole mounting by ensuring that you're getting about six to eight hours of that uh, direct sunlight on the facing of it. Um, now, as Dan said, uh, having a metal pole is really going to help with any predators from climbing up and getting into the bat or the roost of the bat house. Um, what you could do if you had a wooden or a more climbable post is that you can actually install a baffle. Um, so that is just if you have ever seen uh, kind of like on a bird feeder, it's just like a nice conical shape or a funnel shape that you would just put on the pole and that would uh, help prevent anyone from climbing up there. Um, uh, for predators, uh, that'll help them from climbing up. But again, um, while bats are flying around, another predator that we do have to think about are feral cats, uh, because they are quite acrobatic and can see, you know, something flying around and might want to chase it down. Uh, so that's going to be for our security. We've talked about warmth and uh, getting that spacing there. 
And um, we have talked about uh, the water, making sure that, uh, that they will have a resource um, available for them to drink from, as well as what's also going to attract uh, those insects that they're going to be eating too. Um, so when, uh, again, when actually physically maintaining the, uh, the structure of the house, um, you kind of, you want to check on that uh, once a season. Um, another way, especially towards the end of the summer, when bats are going to start migrating or hibernating, uh, that is a good time to check on them. While bats will hibernate in some very secure and ideal uh, bat houses, um, you might you might not always uh, have guaranteed uh, hibernation in there. So at the end of the summer is a good time to really inspect your house and uh, see what's going on. Um, and again, it's just vital to make sure that you don't have anyone sleeping in there during the day. Uh, you can also sparingly, um, and more so at the end of the season, you can flash, a, you can look up at the bottom and uh, just use a light to look in there um, just because of uh, while if you only have a solitary bat in there, they might not produce as much guano or as much uh, droppings, or they might not. Uh, another great way to look at it is that climb rack that we have, um, or that uh, that screen that might be on there. If you see any scratches on there or scratches, that's also a good indicator that you have some bats going in and out. Uh, but if you only have a solitary bat hanging out in there, they're not going to produce as many of those uh, telltale signs. So you can, again, very sparingly, at the after the summer and at the end of the season, use a flashlight to look up in there. Uh, that will also help uh, kind of pinpoint any um, holes inside of your bat box that you may not be able to see that may require some resealing. Um, and so those are some quick, easy ways to uh, maintain your bat house. You want to look at it at the end of every season. And again, if you don't see any bat activity in those first or two seasons, it's a okay. Sometimes it takes them a little bit of time to uh, really attract to a new or find a new favorable roost. Um, another great consideration in having a bat house is uh, if you're building it or if you're buying it is um, trying to buy a multi-chamber house or uh, creating a multi-chamber um, roost or a uh, house, my apologies. And that's just because um, with the more space that will be more favorable conditions for actual nursing colonies. Uh, and another important um, factor in, in trying to help bolster our bat populations and support them is that bats on average only have one pup a year. Uh, that breeding will actually happen in the spring, late springtime. Uh, so if they have a lot of space, larger nurseries will be attracted to there and they'll actually have more success in, uh, you know, fostering their pups or littering their pups there too. So those are some things to consider when installing and trying to maintain your bat house. Um, I, uh, I can move on out of here. And while we're transitioning, I did want to share one fun thing uh, about bats. Uh, Dan had alluded to it earlier with that photo is that those uh, um, in between their, their wings are those membranes connecting their fingers. So bats, they belong to the family of Chiroptera. Um, and if we break down the actual etymology of that word, it's so appropriate. Um, so if we look at Kai, uh, that's ancient Greek for hand, and uh, patera is uh, meaning wings. So literally, it's hand wings, and that is what bats use to fly, is their little hand wings. <laughs> um, but yeah, we can transition. Uh, you know, we've talked about uh, maintaining or installing that bat uh, house and maintaining the habitat needed for uh, having a thriving population, and then also maintaining the physical dwelling of the bat house as well. Yeah, um, just a few other things I forgot to mention while we were talking um, is uh, another reason for having those multi-chambered uh, dwellings is on a pole like we just looked at. It also helps to get more thermal mass, meaning it can soak up more of that sunlight and keep them warmer because when it's on a pole like that, it's exposed to the the cold air on all sides. So the more of that mass you can put in there. I also, uh, behind me is a, a dead part of a birch tree, which is, uh, I mentioned, is a good thing for making habit, natural habitat. But at the same time, if you, to encourage the bats to use this bat box, that's a sad placement. So the garden, we've, uh, We've consulted with this garden before this in putting it in, 
and they've assured us that they're going to take that down so that a predator doesn't just wait there for the bats to come out. So those are just uh, and a few additional things to think about. Uh, we did put in the links, I believe, uh, both uh, instructions for building, uh, a tip sheet for the habitat that we mentioned, as well as uh, just information from the New York City Parks Wildlife Department about the bats, uh, some of the fun facts we shared, as well as the different types of bats. Um, so we encourage you all to build bat habitat, everything, uh, all parts of it in your garden. Um, and the rangers are a resource. Uh, we encourage uh, wildlife, uh, all the benefits of the in all of the gardens from the smallest to our biggest parks. So uh, please reach out to us if you have questions about encouraging any wildlife, particularly bats uh, is what we're talking about today. And we are happy to answer some questions if they've come up. Thanks, Dan and Ashley. Um, we do have a growing list of questions going here. So let's <laughs> let's dive in. I think some of them you answered in the, the later part. So I'm gonna skip around a little bit in here. Um, we had a question specifically about plants that encourage bats to come by. So you mentioned evening blooming plants that attract. Can you give a couple of examples of those for folks? Ones that pop to my pop into my mind that are not necessarily native, but um, moonflower, uh, night flowering jasmine, um, evening primrose. Um, can you think of any other evening blooming? I think that's a pretty great list right there. Um, I, yeah, I, I do not have any more to add to that. Um, however, I know that uh, the Audubon Society, they have a really great link into uh, planting flowers or, or shrubs or trees or, or anything like that to actually attract pollinators to your area um, that will have a classification of when, uh, when in the year that they might, uh, when in the year that they bloom, but also if they are um, uh, evening blooming as well. So that would be a really great resource to look at too. Awesome, thank you. Um, the next question is, do we know they eat mosquitoes? Do bats also eat deer ticks? Do, um, I would say no, just be by the nature of which they hunt uh, is that they use their echolocation. Uh, so another great thing is that, you know, contrary to uh, popular sayings and myths, uh, bats are not blind. However, um, insectivores, they do, they have great eyesight, uh, but they hunt using a very sophisticated uh, type of sonar echolocation, um, which has also inspired some really great human advancements. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they fly and uh, using echolocation um, bounce high frequencies that is too high for us to hear without the use of devices um, and snatch up insects while flying. Uh, some insects have actually even evolved to uh, detect that echolocation and kind of like drop down in the air and evade a bat. Um, as a counter uh, a counter evolution, so it's pretty pretty fascinating. Uh, but because of that hunting style, I don't really see them uh, uh, eating ticks, or and I haven't seen that in any of my research. If you do want a local animal of our wildlife, a native <laughs> wildlife, uh, the Virginia opossum is uh, an animal that a lot. Also, another thing that people, for some reason, are afraid of, but is actually an amazing. Uh, creature. It's North America's only marsupial. We could do a whole nother workshop on encouraging uh, opossums if that's what you'd like, but they do eat hundreds of deer ticks. It's one of their favorite foods to eat. Mm. Awesome. We have kind of a similar question to that, and I think you just answered it, but someone's asking if they specifically eat fireflies because they heard that um, firefly populations are in decline, so I think they're a little worried about um, further upsetting firefly populations. I don't know if that's like fireflies. However, a lot of the improvements that we mentioned, habitat improvements that we did 
we were talking about to improve insects in the evening would also benefit um, fireflies. They like, uh, for part of their breeding, they like to be near water. They like ground cover that um, has um, places that water collects. They like damp environments, which unfortunately is similar to mosquitoes where they like to live. But at the same time, if you can have better habitat, you're gonna have the better predators like the bats that prefer the mosquitoes. And then you're also gonna be attracting your beneficial as well as your lovable insects like the fireflies. But I can't, I don't know if they, if bats like to eat fireflies. Okay. I haven't seen a study focused specifically on that. <laughs> on bat snacks, no, for sure. Um, next question up is, are pesticides used for mosquito control harmful to bats? Yes, that is an amazing question. Thank you so much um, that we actually bring up in creating a uh, habitat for them. And uh, again, that's the idea of security. Um, yeah, so if you are using insecticides or pesticides, that can uh, hugely um, uh, hurt and harm your bat population. So Thank you so much for that wonderful question. And um, please, please avoid that when uh, using, or just don't use it at all and use uh, natural pest control like your bats uh, to, help, um, to help control those insect populations. Uh, there are also really great biocontrols or uh, integrated pest management like dragonflies, which like the Ranger Dan said, we could do a whole other program on, um, on natural ways and uh, biocontrols that you can bring into your garden to uh, reduce that. So thank you again for that question. We do talk about, especially when we've done pond workshops for Green Thumb, mm -hmm. and uh, there is a product, the brand name is Dunk, but for getting rid of mosquito larvae in standing water, and it's actually a, it's derived from a natural bacteria the, that disrupts the larvae's ability to survive and become the mosquitoes that mm -hmm. bite us. So that would actually, would not bother the bats. Um, because it's attract it's it's in um, it's safe for them to drink if it's in the water, but it's uh, affecting the mosquitoes at a different stage of their life from when the bats would be harming them. Um, next question is about temperature. So, I guess this person was thinking about the the bat box on a pole on a sunny day, maybe a very hot sunny day, and is there like a temperature window where um, it's too hot for them in their boxes? And can you help them if that's the case? If you follow the, if you buy one of the boxes or follow the instructions on the uh, bat conservation, what's it called? Uh, we, uh, um, internet. Well, this is this is uh, through Songbird Essentials, uh, but there is, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the BatConservancy.org, um, as well as uh, BatNet that has some really great uh, tips. And then I have something to add. So the way they're designed with the venting and the, the wood, they don't overheat. Um, it's more important to have that warmth for them to return to. Uh, so they actually, um, our environment, Unfortunately for us, stays warm all through the night uh, during the summer. But uh, yeah, you, like in desert areas, you wouldn't want to do a pole mounted one anyway because the temperature drops to too cold. There's too much of a temperature differential during the day. Um, but yeah, the, they're designed, uh, if you follow the either instructions to construct them or buy one of the the store-bought ones, they're designed to not overheat during the day. And um, brown bats specifically are hugely temperature tolerant. Um, they can withstand uh, a wide range of temperatures from going, you know, to, uh, I believe, down to in the single below zero uh, up to, <laughs> um, up to you know, an overage of 100 degrees. So uh, especially the bats that we're gonna get around here, um, big brown bats, little brown bats, they're, they're quite tolerant of the, the temperatures that we will experience around here. Um, and sometimes uh, that actually hints on a, a natural behavior um, of uh, if they do 
plants get a little too hot, you can see them come out during the day and then they'll re-return to their box. So um, if that ever does happen, it's okay. They will go back to their roost and uh, it'll be absolutely fine. They also, you might even just see one, like Ranger Dan said, uh, that Eastern red bat just kind of flying out in the day, going for a drink of water and then going back to sleep. So um, they, they adjust uh, very easily. Cool. Um, or they can adjust. And someone is asking if, the direction that the bat house faces is important. The yes, so that was the, the reason for the direction is mostly to catch the most uh, sunlight as well as to avoid predator hazards. So in New York City, if you have a southeast exposure, uh, you're going to get the most morning sunlight, which is going to be the most attractive for those that to return back to a warm house um, and then keeping it away from places where animals might fly roost to wait for them or climb up to, to get the bats, the predators is, that's the main reason for those placement and opening considerations. Um, for the one that we looked at, it would be fine if it turns more to south facing as long as it's catching the most sunlight. Mm -hmm. The um, speaking of the the bat box that we looked at, do you have a sense of how pricey the telescopic poles are? Um, that for the the pole itself, I, I actually don't have a figure on that. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know. I know okay. that you can buy, and again, like lumber poles, like those are pretty inexpensive. Uh, and you just take an extra step of, you know, baffling for mitigation of uh, predators climbing up there. And that's also relatively inexpensive as well. Um, you can get a nice uh, uh, four by six pole or four by four um, reaching up to 10 to 16 feet for about. And also you want to see how it's treated too, because it's very important um, to make sure that it's, it's uh, uh, just heat treated. Uh, but, you know, for for 10 to 15 bucks. Um, yeah. But for the metal pole, I don't know if you have uh, any more of a lead on that. No, the gardener that installed this said that he that they're watching. So maybe they could put it in the comments about how much it <laughs> yeah, costs. <perfect>. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And then um, the box that, that we're looking at in Green Oasis today, how many bats like, would typically live in a, a box that size? Yeah, so bats, um, they, <laughs> they're amazing. They are very compressible. Um, they, uh, uh, and honestly, that's unfortunately a reason why white nose syndrome can, um, spread so quickly throughout a colony is because they're always just clamoring over one another and just, uh, cramming into a space. So a, I believe that might also be a, a single chamber in there as well. But you can have, um, I would say, anywhere from 20 to 50 bats in there. Uh, but I probably wouldn't put it past 50. That's a surprising. The, the demo one lot. we showed, I think, is rated for 20 to 30, uh, which is mm -hmm. slightly smaller than the one that they installed here. Um, so we talked about. Uh, we talked about cats and raccoons and different things that can get into. Um, Somebody was asking about mice, like, do, would field mice be a concern for bat boxes? I would say no, uh, just by the nature of field mice, um, kind of, they prefer more covered or dense uh, areas where they're going to burrow or, you know, stay towards the ground. For them to climb up into the box, that would present a danger to them of being picked up by a, uh, an opportunistic bird, um, which I don't see them uh, uh, trying to go just because of how exposed that space is. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't see that too much of a, of a danger. I don't think so, because they also, they like to bring a lot of material for insulation <laughs> into a spot and it wouldn't stay there, the field mice, I mean. Um, would not stay up in the bat box. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, how far from a natural body of water would be too far for bats? I mean, how close um, do they need the water source to be? 
Yeah, so um, there it, it does depend on the species uh, because some species will fly out quite uh, a distance. But if you were able to uh, have a water body, I believe within 500 to 1,000 feet, um, for them to fly and get water, that is a pr- that's like a pretty good ideal range. So if you have something even closer, amazing. Um, but you want to have uh, uh, something nearby or within that vicinity. Um, but again, it does depend on the species as well. And it's all about um, balancing the ideal with uh, mm-hmm. just trying to encourage better habitat. Um, so yes, they might choose if you're the garden down the street has the water the sunshine the bat might be more likely to choose that um but they do range over a pretty large area Mm -hmm. during the night so they can find water uh over a slightly longer distance and i think you touched on this before but how long like should it take uh, for bats to inhabit your bat box if they're going to? And at what point would you maybe start over? Yeah, so uh, again, um, a couple of different factors will determine that. Like if you are trying to uh, use this bat box to um, attract bats that are maybe roosting in an area that you don't want them to, like inside of a structure, uh, that can happen a little quicker. Uh, so that can happen within a season or so. And then, um, you know, once you see them flying out, you kind of like close up any any holes or openings and then they'll find their new roosting. Uh, but for trying to introduce or just going into a new area, um, a little patience is required. Uh, so um, if you don't see anything in the first year or two of uh, those seasons, um, don't, don't despair. Um, it's not until about, you know, maybe your third year of not having any activity at all of uh, when you want to kind of go ahead and reconsider where you're placing your bat box. Um, and again, at the end of the season, using those, um, those techniques that we talked about to check for activity and lowering the box if needed uh, to, to really um, confirm or deny, or well, not deny, but confirm if you've had any, anyone um, or any bats going up to roost there. Okay, one last question for you both today. Um, If a community garden is using pesticides to control mosquitoes, um, what, how can you still attract bats to the space? Or is pesticide like a non-starter for them? I was gonna say, if I stop using those pesticides, uh, uh, Dan um, or Dan brought up a really great alternative, especially if you have uh, uh, standing water or water features within your garden. Um, but this idea of integrated pest management or biocontrol is to really get rid of those artificial and um, oh, <laughs> poisonous, potentially poisonous to uh, the animal uh, measures of pest control and introducing organic, uh, well, natural organisms into an environment to control that. And really uh, what uh, we often, for pest animals like mosquitoes and rats, we work a lot with the Department of Health. And Mm -hmm. the best thing that you can do to stop um, mosquitoes uh, on your, even before uh, management with bats and other wildlife that eats mosquitoes is to get rid of standing water anywhere on your property. It's better than any pesticide because if they can't breathe, they're going to go somewhere else. Uh, they're, they're, they're drawing your blood, they're getting your blood uh, to lay their eggs, which go in the water. So um, no old tires around, no old uh, things. Make sure that the water is circulating in your uh, ponds if you have them. Uh, no empty flower pots or turn them all over, turn your wheelbarrows over. They can, it, I think it's about a two week cycle. Uh, so if water sits there for more than two weeks, um, which is tough in New York City in the fall. I mean, a lot of the rooftops gather water, but uh, the best thing you can do is not have standing water uh, to get rid of mosquitoes. And then that's better for everything uh, if you don't have that standing water. Okay, and I, I lied. There's one more question. 
Um, <laughs> if you're in an urban setting and you're not in a garden, could you secure the bat house to something like a chain link fence, like the kind that you see around um, baseball diamonds or courts or something along those lines instead of a pole? Yeah, so the the trouble that you might have with a fence is just the height of it. Um, ideally, the absolute minimum that you want to have uh, for a bat box um, is 10 feet. And that's because bats will drop out of the box and then take off in flight. Um, so finding a fence that is at least 10 feet could be a little tricky, depending on where you're at. Um, you can secure it to a structure like a house or a garage or a shed if it's up high enough. Um, and again, that's, that's actually, especially for a chamber or multi-chamber box, like the one that we showed today, um, that's actually a, a more preferred way because of the heat regulation and um, the, the, the stability uh, that it could provide by using that technique. But it's really making sure that you have, um, one, the opening around it. So making sure that there's a clearing of branches, shrubs, trees, um, about uh, 15 feet or so, or I'm sorry, 20 feet or so away from uh, on the horizontal away from the box. And then it's anywhere at least 10 feet off the ground, but ideally 15 or so feet off the ground. You also want to pay attention to what I forgot to mention this too, uh, where if it's over a pass or a door or a window, as beneficial as for the soil as the guano is, you don't want to be walking under it or that, which also disturbs the bats if you're constantly opening and closing a window or a door. Uh, there have been, I've heard success stories and seen them uh, in New York City parks where they didn't necessarily want to put a pole, but uh, putting it on a brick building, which is good because it, uh, so if, a, if you have a south facing brick wall that's again over that 10 feet, uh, both to protect it from predators, but give them a place to drop out. Um, that's another option. Of course, uh, getting uh, the mounting on a brick wall presents problems, um, but, uh, but that's another option for if you don't have a good place to put a pole, if you have a south facing brick wall. All right, um, so that's, that was it. We did all of the questions. Um, so I just want to remind everybody that tuned in today that we recorded and it is going to be made available to you after. Um, we'll share the link in the chat where you can find all kinds of other recorded workshops that Green Thumb has offered in the past. And we'll follow up with you after today's workshop to send out all of the, the resources that uh, Rangers Dan and Ashley shared with us as well. So um, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Rangers, Dan, and Ashley, thank you so much. I learned a lot. I think I'm going to tell everybody that there is a bat smaller than a Q-tip now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> from today. And um, thank you so much for facilitating. Thank you to everyone at Green Thumb that made this possible and to Green Oasis for hosting us today. So um, be on the lookout for those resources. And thank you, everyone.